everybody. I'm Bailey Dickey, I lead networks here at GGB, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our sixth annual Evolving Enterprise. Um, this year, we're doing something a little bit different. We're hosting a series of seven masterclasses on different top of mind topics for CEOs and functional leaders. This series is going to run every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific through April 13th. Um, and if you haven't already, you can do upcoming masterclasses and RSVP via the link in the chat, which I will drop in there right now. I'll keep dropping it in throughout the hour in case we have more folks join. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank Silicon Valley Bank for their continued partnership on Evolving Enterprise and for helping make this series happen. Um, and that's all I've got. I'm very excited to kick things off today with a conversation on building and running product teams and turn it over to Glenn Solomon. Oh, you're muted, Glenn. <laughs> Great way to start. Thanks so much, Bailey. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, really excited uh, to be kicking off our Evolving Enterprise Series uh, here at GGV. I'll also, uh, on behalf of everybody at GGV, welcome you, welcome everybody to, to this first session on product uh, and thank SVB as well. Um, and also thank each of you for attending and joining and, and hopefully making this a, a really uh, rich session uh, in fact, many of you have already done your part. Uh, we got lots of great questions as part of uh, the RSVPs, uh, and we've done our best to incorporate those questions uh, into today's dialogue and would also encourage anyone who uh, during the session uh, has other questions to put them in the chat, and we will do our best to, to include everything that we can. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn things over to my colleague, Dan who's going to uh, join me in moderating this session. And uh, Dan, take it away. Thanks, Glenn, and good to see everybody here. Um, really excited to chat today about building and scaling product teams. We're joined by two fantastic product leaders who I'll let introduce themselves and can dive into some of the topics you guys sent over and um, some topics that we're seeing you know, are top of mind for startup leaders you know, across our portfolio and elsewhere. So with that, uh, Tara, or Tara. Um... Uh, hi, everyone. Tara Goldman here. Um, I am SVP of product at Electric AI. We are looking to make IT easy for small businesses. Uh, my background in product spans a variety of industries from um, now IT to health tech and ed tech. Um, started my career back in the day, at least in the New York area, before um, product was really a, a function and worked more on the kind of advertising agency, building products for our customers, and then moved naturally um, into companies where I was able to help them build their product strategies. Um, happy to be here today, and I'm excited um, to get into some of the conversation. And uh, Ilan. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, uh, Elon Frank, um, I have about 25 years of product experience, but we don't need to count all of that. Um, most recently, I was at Slack, um, joined in 2016 to really bring that company to large and regulated organizations, so leading all the enterprise and infrastructure performance scale and all of that. Um, and uh, about a month ago, I made a change uh, left and joined Airtable to head up platform. Uh, here, so I can uh, happy to speak to to either of those. Um, great to be here, and uh, look forward to to all these great questions. Awesome. Maybe on a, a good place to start would be in your experience at Slack. Um, you know, you came in early to a company that had a very product focused founder, and I think what a lot of um, companies struggle with is you know how they should transition from founder led to more professional led product management. So I'd love to hear a bit about your experience at Slack? Yeah, I can certainly speak to that. I can also speak to a lot of the product advising that I do, um, where, you know, CEOs will, will invite me in and say, um, you know, I want to hire my first, you know, PM. Um, and that's always a great conversation. And I, I always answer back why, um, because it's, I think that as companies grow, it's really important for a CEO to basically focus on things that uh, he or she are uniquely, you know, suited for. Um, sometimes that part of that is product management, and Stuart never let go completely of, of product management because he cares deeply about the the usability of Slack 
Um, and he's also uniquely qualified. He's just one of the best product thinkers I have ever seen, you know, think about basically a, a screen and how a human will react to that screen. And so he stays involved in a lot of the uh, product workshops and into the details of, of product decisions. But when I joined to lead enterprise, um, he basically, I remember on the first day, um, he, uh, hopefully no one objects to foul language. Uh, Stuart uses a lot of it. Um, he, uh, you know, gave me a hug in the lobby. He's like, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Don't fuck it up. And that was about the last thing he said about enterprise. Like for, for four and a half years, I basically like did not have to have a meeting with Stuart. Um, and, uh, and so he knew that like, that's not an area that is his expertise. And he just basically let that go. So that is, that is, I think, part of the, the, you know, founder to CEO process is to know like what you are uniquely suited to, to do and, and, and what you need to bring outside, you know, expertise to, to build. Um, yeah, I would, I would also just add to that because um, this company uh, that I'm advising right now, she also came to me and said, I think I need to hire, you know, a product person and similarly asked the same question. In that case, it was, this is not my skill set. This is not my bread and butter. My subject matter expertise lies in the business. And it, for them, it's more in the real estate um, industry. Um, she's like, I'm not well-versed in technology. I am not trying to be well-versed there. I need someone who can basically brain dump for me and understand, you know, the business goals and work with, with my COO and my head of partnerships and who can bring that together in a technology platform. And so I think on the flip side, it's really understanding, um, again, what are the needs and what, where does that fit? And in that case, I think it makes sense to bring someone in um, earlier on to help them realize the vision that's in their head. Kara, maybe just to put, push a little further in that, um, you know, if, if, a, if, a, for whatever reason, a CEO or founder has decided, yeah, like it's time to build a product team. Um, any, you know, thoughts you could share on the types of qualities uh, that, you know, people should look for in a, in a first hire or two, um, you know, I'm sure getting off on the right foot uh, is important. And so curious what you'd recommend in terms of like the type of person to be looking for, maybe, you know, how senior, um, is prior experience critical, et cetera? Yeah, great question. Absolutely, prior experience is critical. I think this is one of those areas where I personally think you need a player coach kind of model, where if you bring someone in too senior, they're not going to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. And that's what happens when you're, you're the first hire. And if you bring someone in too junior, they're more going to act as a project manager, where you need that person to ask the tough questions and be curious and having had a little bit of this, uh, been there, done that. Um, to, to navigate. So, um, you know, I think somewhere in the mid kind of like senior mid area is probably right, um, where they could grow into a leader over time. But again, you really need them to wear multiple hats, you need them to have comfort with ambiguity, you need them to be able to hold their own um, in meetings with senior level folks, because the company's small at that at that point, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and be able to wear the hat of you know, data analysis and UX design and working with engineers, um, but also translating a lot of the business stuff. And they're probably going to do other things that are, aren't even product related, um, whether it's, you know, customer support, et cetera. So again, just being able to um, make, sh like shape something from nothing. And more importantly, um, be able to kind of tease out the why and what it is that, that you're trying to do. I think this is a lesson learned that I, at least my friend had where she brought in someone early on who was more of an executor and they wound up in a place where because she wasn't asking those questions, um, they were then kind of a little bit behind on their product launch and really need someone, again, a little bit more strategic, can ask the tough questions and bridge everything together, take it to the next level. So maybe more player coach rather than all player or all coach at that, at that stage. Um, yeah. Could you maybe take it a step further? Like if you're starting from scratch and advising a, you know, a founder on, okay, in addition to that first person, let's talk about like, you know, the first year in product and, and maybe like how you ought to think about structuring a team. Um, you know, curious, curious what you'd recommend is, is there like, um, you know, some things you've seen work well, like how do you split up the tasks and should you have multiple product managers across a big product or, you know, do you just have one and who reports to whom? Curious to get your, 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 your thoughts on how you'd advise 
um, you know, structuring that the early, early growth of a, of a product team? Yeah, I mean, this is like the cop out answer, but it all depends. And I'll give you the criteria on how it depends. Um, it depends on, you know, first of all, who's doing, you know, UX design, who's doing engineering, is that in-house, is that out of house? It depends on whether you have a customer success team. It depends on how big the product is. If there's um, natural areas that, you know, are, are able to be managed, if it's small enough and you need someone who's like a product owner to support. Um, I think that I'll give you an example. When I walked into electric, there were only three PMs and it was a very broad product. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, um, you know, I thought about the way that the team was structured was very narrow. And so you had a team that was focused on, you know, narrow scope A, narrow scope B and narrow scope C. But then my question was, well, what about the rest of it? And so I think you have to think about, right, what, are, what is the goal of the product? What are you trying to achieve? And how do you structure teams around that? Um, and in the beginning, it's going to be broader. <laughs> And so there's going to be a kind of a broader scope, but it, it may be more narrow goals. And then over time, I think that um, I think that gets more specific. Um, you mentioned like reporting structure. Um, I think in the beginning, also like the the first product person ends up being the de facto head of product, right? So what will end up happening is you'll have the first, you know, or the second PM or the third PM, and maybe even the UX designer, you know, report into that person. And then as that team grows, is when you start to specialize and then decide at what point do you need leadership, you know, over those particular functions. And it's a tough call, right? Because you don't want to add a ton of overhead um, early on. Um, and that's where, again, like, I think you need to really be mindful about where you're headed. People do have to play the player coach kind of model. And then if you're planning kind of into, you know, an advance around where is your product going and what does that look like in terms of resourcing and investment, then you can start to think about at what point does this need to split out, you know, specialize and become its own function kind of as a peer to product. Um Speaking of like that function, one thing we've seen in some of our companies is more of a kind of cross-functional pod team uh, structure where you see like product embed with engineering teams and maybe design as well, um, like together versus having, you know, kind of more of a separate um, approach, you know, maybe uh, product sitting next to engineering, but like this kind of more pod of intermingled have, have you, how, have, how have you, um, how, what experience have you had with, with either of those approaches and any, any thoughts on which works well and what kind of circumstance? Uh, yeah, I personally have not worked in any other model other than the pod approach. Um, okay. I think, I think the job of product is, um, like, first of all, everyone needs to have the most context possible to do their jobs. And I think what makes it hard when they're separate is that you are now having limited information and limited context and you get that kind of tossed over the wall um, kind of working environment. And I think in order to, to build great products, you wanna have not just your PM understanding everything, but your designer and, and your engineering lead at minimum, if not the engineers as well. Um, and so having those teams really focus on a mission and a goal and doing, you know, discovery and delivery together, in my mind, um, you'll be able to achieve better outcomes for the business because everyone is invested in what are we doing here? Why are we doing it? And then the creativity kind of flows from there. I think that all that's right. Um, you might be asking Glenn something maybe a little bit different because I totally agree on the pot approach. Um, you might be asking at the senior level or the most senior level, um, where should PM report? Where should engineering report? You know, should should you have like a PM report into a CTO? Should you have the opposite where the VP of engineering reports into a CPO? Um, that is where I think, first of all, when you're a 10 or 12 person company or whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, I coached my uh, my kids soccer teams when they were like U6. Uh, have you ever seen like 10 kids just all run at the ball? Like that's what, you know, 10 person startups are. So like, it doesn't matter when you get I, into- I like, had many U8, years of many years of coaching. Yeah. U5, U6, U7. I, I, exactly. Later on, it makes a difference. And I think later on, it is really important for both the CPO and the CTO to report directly into the CEO. And to be on you, I've seen other models where the product reports in engineering or engineering reports in a product, and both of them, in my opinion, fail miserably for you know various reasons. We don't need to necessarily go into them. Um, the other thing that you, uh, I think, uh, Tara touched on uh, in the pod model in an early is 
um, you might not have enough. One of the problems is you might not have enough PM or design skills to go around. Um, and one of the things that we did early on in Slack, which I, I really like is, um, and I'm seeing this at Airtable as well, is we basically set the expectations that engineers could be designers and PMs as well. Like you don't have to have a PM title or a designer title in order to like design a screen. If you're an engineer and you see a bug or you see a problem or something like that, and your, you know, your PM or your designer is like completely, you know, uh, maxed out, go ahead and fix it. Go ahead and roll that out. It's not the end of the world. We can, we can undo it, you know? So um, that was a this kind of early cultural training that we had um, that, that I thought really helped us to, to move faster. Yeah, I love that. And that's what I mean by when you're hiring your first PM, like having these skill sets are really helpful because they are going to have to do some UX design in the beginning. And then same same scenario where you're not going to have equal number of you know skill sets to go around. For example, one designer, three PMs, you don't want that person to be a bottleneck. There are you know transferable skills that folks can pick up and, and pitch in on. Outside of kind of the interaction between product and engineering. I'd love to hear how you think about sort of the right cadence and the right types of interactions between you know, product and sales and marketing as well, both kind of as companies are very early and you know as they scale over time. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take a first shot if you'd like me to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that um, as, as they scale over time, uh, I think this is one of the things that product excels at, which you know uh, we welcome. Uh, I remember inviting a lot of engineers into sales meetings and all that. It's great. It's great to have you know give them that exposure, but they have like usually better things to do than to sit an hour you know with a customer. This is where product actually excels, and and I think it's important, um, as Tara said initially, is to hire someone who's totally flexible and can can run you know uh, a Zendesk tickets. Um, and understand better what the customer pain points are there, you know, sit on enterprise customer calls and hear from a CEO or CIO what they want from their requirements. Um, and that, that is who you're hiring for, I think, uh, primarily in one of those, you know, in those first hires, for sure, if not later on. Yeah, I think just to um, kind of take that to later stage companies, I think it, it, everything gets harder as you scale. <laughs> And so as teams get bigger, as orgs get bigger, especially in remote work, I think this is a challenge that I don't think any company has figured out yet. It becomes increasingly harder to keep teams aligned, right? And scale and make sure communication is flowing back and forth. And I think, you know, sales and marketing is one feedback loop that you want to make sure you, you are kind of keeping open, but also customer success and customer teams. And so I think um, in the beginning, it's really easy to just sit in, you know, join customer calls, like join a demo. It's very flexible. It's very loose. Um, as teams get bigger, it becomes more structured, more barriers get put up between teams. And that's where I think you have to start to think around about more processes and programs that allow teams to work more cross-functionally together, because otherwise, if left to their own devices, some people will just naturally, you know, weave their way through and make it and other people won't because it's just, it's hard. Um, one thing that we've done recently is, um, as we've scaled and we've, you know, increased all the all the all the departments are scaling and we're having you know we have so many more customers things like programs like adopt a customer right where we partner with the cs team and we say okay for this book of business we're going to assign this pod and it's their job to get on you know they're assigned to these 15 customers and it provides more structure that way they're they're going to do that work anyway but that way we're being more thoughtful and strategic around how we're getting the voice of the customer across our entire product engineering and design team so the, the three of them are getting on those calls with our customers yeah, I love that. We had the same program with the same exact name at Slack in, in nice. 2018. And um, in, in going back to earlier, we also had a mandatory, you know, Zendesk rotation uh, for everyone in the company um, in, in the early days of Slack. You had to do an hour a week. Uh, it started as two hours a week, and then it went went down from that as we scaled. But um, but it was it was just great learnings all around and great funny, empathy building. Funny story. Um, we we were an investor in Zendesk. And uh, in the early days, Zendesk had a Zendesk rotation program. So everybody <laughs> who joined Zendesk had to had to basically man the you know customer support uh, Zendesk line um, before they went off to do whatever functional functionally they'd been hired to do, which I think was was really helpful in making them 
super customer focused. There's nothing like dog fooding your own product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sarah, you mentioned um, remote before, um, and we were chatting before everybody got on the call about how basically all of us um, are mostly working from home these days. Uh, and so I'd be curious, you know, what unique challenges you've seen in product folks getting the right context on their business in a remote world and, you know, initiatives that you've put in place to, um, you know, help combat that. Yeah, I think, again, I think it's a really tough problem. Like one, the pro is, and I think we mentioned this before, you get access to great talent. And I'm going to be the first to say, I've been able to hire incredible people I would have never had access to before. And I'm so grateful for them. Um, on the flip side, right, I think having been doing this for two years, um, it gets harder and harder to collaborate and communicate. And at the same time, people are, they have Zoom fatigue. There's, they don't want any more meetings. Um, and it's like, there's so much, there's been so much cognitive load that you have to figure out ways to be, I think, provide the context, but in bite-sized ways so that people actually absorb it. Um, and so one thing that we've done is, again, it's important to bring prod, eng, and design together, at least for us. You know, we're not as big as Slack, but we're not as small as a, you know, a, a startup just getting started. And, um, you know, we try to uh, provide as much context as we can in these biweekly meetings where we've got all three of those functions together. Before we were operating as separate units, we had a product meeting with engineering all hands. Um, and we're injecting um, voice of the customer in there. We're bringing in cross-functional speakers from, from sales and marketing. We're sharing data and, and analysis so that everybody's getting that information at the same time. Um, which I think has been really helpful. Um, I talked about adopt a customer and we're doing similar programs with our sales teams. We also use Gong where we have, you know, recordings that our teams can tap into. Um, and again, I think it's more about not over process and over kind of like providing these programs, but some structure that makes it easy for folks, for folks to be able to um, digest this information in ways that are accessible to them rather than force them into, I don't know, like two hour long meetings. Um, we do have, we did our first also product and engineering kickoff at the top of the year, you know, sales has their big kickoff, CS has their big kickoff. And I think that was really helpful as well to run a similar exercise where we had other execs from the organization talk about what their goals were for the year. What are they working on? Bring in outside speakers, you know, some of our investors um, and provide context for where we're headed. Um, and that was a really successful thing that I think we want to repeat mid-year as well, just like um, our go-to-market teams do. Yeah, I think that um, first of all, the the, the high level, um, the benefits outweigh the costs, um, the benefits to hiring remotely. And I just think that the the companies who want to move faster, who want to build stronger, more diverse PM teams, probably engineering teams as well, though that's not my my ex area of expertise, um, are going to be hiring remotely. Um, now, with that said. Uh, at, at Slack, we did a, a ton of surveys. They, they set up actually the Future Forum, which is like this think tank on like the future of work. Um, and the main thing that we saw, and this is not any surprise um, for remote teams is uh, a lack of or a reduction in a sense of belonging. Um, and so if you, if you can solve for that, you can solve for just about anything. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing at Airtable as we're hiring remotely is setting the expectation that people are gonna to have to come together. You know, you're, you could be hired in Seattle, you could be hired in, you know, Minnesota, but you should set the expectation that you're gonna to have to be coming, you're gonna to have to come together as your team, with your team on most likely a monthly basis, at the worst, a quarterly basis. So, you know, set that, that expectation upfront as you're hiring, because that's gonna be the thing that I think all of us are gonna to have to solve for in the years to come. I don't see a world where we go, many of us go back to offices five days a week. I don't, I don't see that world. There's going to be companies that do that, but I think the, the folks on this call, probably not so. I couldn't agree more. And you just reminded me that is something that um, we also um, believe very strongly. And we brought in our teams last September, <laughs> right before I feel like that Omicron variant came in. Um, and it was hugely successful because we had hired all these people in 2020 and in early 21, and we've never met them. And honestly, the whole goal was really to just get everyone together, team build, get aligned around, you know, what are we focused on more than anything? Because if we could do that in person, it makes it much easier to go back to, you know, whatever state you're coming from to be able to work together remotely. And, you know, we plan to do that again in, in May. And I think Elon, it's so critical. Um, 
I agree. I don't think we're ever going back. I agree that we're going to get access. We have to keep hiring, you know, remotely. We're going to get access to the best talent. And frankly, like that's what people want. So it's going to be very hard to hire without it. At the same time, I think there's so much value in face-to-face and we can't, I personally believe like just being remote only is, is very difficult. And so having those opportunities, whether it's, you know, twice a year or quarterly are going to be so incredibly vital to keeping teams, you know, working well together. Makes a ton of sense. Um, um, one thing that can fracture teams or make life difficult. Um, we got, a, we got several questions that we've kind of amalgamated into one, uh, about, you know, the, this common problem where sales kind of come, comes back to the organization and says, if we just had this one feature, we could close a whole bunch of business. And it's not a feature that's on, you know, on, on a near-term roadmap. And oftentimes that gets sort of, um, you know, put in the lap of, of somebody in product and that person has to figure out, you know, how to, how and whether to respond and how to respond. Um, Elon, maybe I'll ask you that one. I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen some of this in your career, like any, any, any thoughts or, um, I don't know when, when this has happened to you or folks on your team, how you guys have tried to respond and, you know, be, be as responsive as possible to sales, but also at the same time, you know, um, n- not, not sacrifice uh, the long-term for, for short-term. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've got a lot to say on this topic. I advise a lot of companies in this space. Um, and you can imagine this is a very popular question is when, when do I say no to the customer? First of all, um, my, my dad was a salesperson. He had a plaque on his desk that said, salesmanship begins when the customer says no. Um, I flip it around for product management and say product management begins when you say no to the customer. Um, And so that is, that is a skill that you need to, you need to learn. Um, It's obviously not just ruthlessly saying no to everything, um, but it's a, it's, it's that product management skill where you're basically prioritizing the things that are most common and and that also are aligned with the customer objectives. I'm sorry, the company objectives in order to, you know, to move the, the company forward as quickly as possible. Um, and sometimes customers' demands are going to be squarely aligned with that, and sometimes they're going to be, you know, off in left field. One of the tricks that I like to do is, uh, well, of course, it's always good to just learn how to say no. But if, if you know, that's not your strong suit, one of the tricks I like to do is actually create a cap, a customer advisory board. And you, I, I advise companies to do that as quickly as possible. Um, you have five customers, put them on a cab. You know, you have 20 customers, put them on a cab. You have 100 customers, you should not have a cab with 100 customers. Um, but when you, the reason why I say that is if you come together every six months in review, there's a couple things that you do. One is um, that customer is going to be able to see that they are maybe off in left field because they see the discussion that's happening at the table. And that discussion is going to be very apparent that what they're asking for is just one of you know, 20 rather than, you know, in their head when they're one-on-one with you, it's 100% of the question of the request is what they're saying. And so why can't you build 100% of what I'm, of what I'm saying? Um, and so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, um, I always say I've never lost a customer on a cab. The reason why is because the cab and also product management and that, you know, uh, um, coordination with customers is all about building a relationship. When that customer sees that you are responsive and responsive doesn't mean just do everything they say, but that you're taking notes and that you come back a month later and you say, I, I checked with design, I checked with engineering, here's what we can do. You know, this is a year long, but we could do this. You know, we could have this workaround. When they see that interaction, when they build that trust with you, then, you know, it answers actually half of their question, which is, am I investing in a company that is investing in me? Or am I investing in a company that's just doing something else and I have no idea where they're going? Right. Um, and so that's, uh, that was a, a really long answer to your question, but, uh, hopefully, hopefully that was somewhat helpful. A cab seems like a, a great, uh, a great way to ensure people realize that, that their request isn't the only request, um, and, and also make them feel respected and heard Tara, anything, anything you'd add? I'm sure you've seen this as well. Yeah, um, agree on the cab. I think coming back to the sales aspect, I think this happens, you know, luckily not as often as I would expect um, at, at where I'm at right now, but it does happen, right? And I think there's a couple of things. One being really aligned at the executive level around what are the strategic goals and what are we trying to achieve here? Uh, because being able to come back to that and say, okay, does this match up with where we're headed or not? Um, 
And if we do something like this, I think I agree saying no is a really strong skill. One way that I like to do that is being really transparent about what it means we wouldn't do. So, um, and, and kind of posing back questions around, okay, fine. Like if we were to take this on, here are all the questions I would have. And, you know, here's what it would, what we would give up as a result. Is that a decision that we want to make? And it's more kind of democratizing the product prioritization decision, even though you're not really, and, and kind of sharing that load with everybody else and having them to come to the conclusion, like maybe this isn't the best use of our time right now. In some cases there might be a workaround, but in other cases, it usually arrives in a similar um, in kind of a common answer around, okay, makes sense. How do we kind of um, evaluate this at a later date? I think to follow on to that, it's really important, I think, to have a framework and a criteria to be able to say, okay, what is coming? What are the things coming out of sales? How do we quantify those? And um, not everything is going to be apples to apples. I think the one-offs um, can be remediated by evaluating maybe on a quarterly basis, um, you know, what are the top things that sales needs to open up you know, Sam or Tam or what have you, um, and how do we stack rank those together? What's the level of effort that goes along with them? And how do we want to prioritize that? I think if that can be aligned um, on at the top, I think it becomes much easier to thwart the sideways, you know, what if we did this for one customer? Nice. I think the, uh, um, I, I love the idea of, of making sure people understand that there's trade-offs. Um, and so, you know, not, no, no, no request comes for free. It has impacts. Um, I mean, we don't want to say no, right? It's always like a tough decision of like, we want to do all the things. There's finite resources and time. Yeah. Help us help you. Um, uh, one of the things that I've done in, in cabs is like the dollar voting exercise. You know, mm -hmm. it was easier, you know, back in the physical days where you literally just put it up on a board and put, gave people, you know, stickers and had them vote with dollars, each each sticker representing five dollars out of 100 or something. But um, they could just very, very quickly visually see, OK, these are the things that you're investing in and you should be investing in because a lot of people want. And these are the things that just, you know, we, we can't we can't do everything. I answered one of the questions in the chat. I hope that's OK. That's awesome. Um um, Tara, switching gears a little bit, you know, we were talking more earlier about customer discovery and, and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, how it can be a little looser when you're young, when the company's smaller, but over time as, as or, or as get bigger, you, you, you need, you need to add some structure. Um, how do you, how have you thought about building customer discovery into your, you know, workflow and in, in your product team? Um, and, and maybe a, a secondary question is, uh, structured user, user research, um, and, and how you have either incorporated it or not in, into your thinking. Yeah. Um, two parter. So customer discovery, I think starts with, first of all, understanding what the customer needs are, right. It always starts there. And then it feeds into how is the team ideating on potential solutions to get there throughout the process. We're always coming back to the customer and validating with them, you know, is this working for their needs, whether it's, you know, usability testing, card sorting, there's tons of methodologies, surveys that we can make sure that we are, um, doing so that we are not building and then not meeting their needs. I think that's just part of the, the kind of software development life cycle that I would expect a pod to be able to run on their own. I think um, something that usually gets underinvested in early is, is user research, like UX research as a function. Um, two things that I invested in, I think, earlier than most companies are UX research and product operations. And they seem like luxuries if you think about it, but I think they're... Um, they're kind of like these amplifiers for the team. Um, because if you can get someone who is specialized in UX research, they become a center of excellence and they can help really um, get a point of view on what exactly is like from a strategic perspective, you know, what do our customers run? Where are we headed? Where, um, what are the 10X things that we should be thinking about in the long term? Whereas if your pods are continuously doing customer discovery, I think oftentimes, at least like early to mid-stage growth stage, they're very much focused on their particular area of the product and mission. Mm -hmm. And everyone would love to do that kind of work, but the reality is they usually just don't have the time. And unless you're investing in a particular team or a person to go kind of spend doing the, the, the longer term thinking, I think this is one of those areas where you start to get a lot of ROI from around 
broader research from your customer base, from your prospect base that can really start to inform all of your teams. Um, you know, one, one study that we're running right now around top tasks is like really understanding from our customers, like what are the top things that they want out of our product now and in the future? That's really going to inform everything that we do. Um, and, you know, it's just been really, um, it's just been an exponential value add, at least for us, that I, that I feel like um, is well worth the money. Awesome. Elon, any, have you, have you done any, any, um, any work with, uh, this type of user research? Um, yeah, um, uh, I have both, uh, Slack and Airtable have fantastic user research teams. Um, I will say that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't know, uh, I haven't been able to map all the attendees here on the call. I will say that early on, um, it, it could be a massive time sink and not a good use of, of your time. I, I mean, hopefully as a founder, you have a gut sense of where you want the product to go and you should follow that gut. Um, later on, when you start letting go and product management starts taking on and you're not involved in every decision and all that, it's fantastic to have that user research as background. The thing that I found with user research, I would say once you once you start getting into that, that world is that, um, you, you know, it, I think it's healthy. Someone once used the analogy of scouts, like like scouts and like an army. Like you, you are the army, and you know engineers or soldiers or something like that. And your user research are scouts. They go out ahead. You know they they go in the forest. They go around the other enemy camp, and they kind of look at things, and then they come back and report. Now. That's great. That does not mean that you as a general should go and just do exactly what they said. Like they said to go up this creek and go left and right. No, but it's information that you can use to help you. But the other important part of it is that they should be ahead of you. They shouldn't be like looking at the field and telling you like, here's what we've, here's the lay of the land. Here's the, you know, here's your army. And here's, that's not really helpful. Like I need you to go, you know, six months, nine months in the future and tell me a little bit about that. And then I can make a decision whether we take it or not. Um, but, but that's how I would think mostly about, about using user research, but it's probably, like I said, not the best thing to do at a, at a 10 to 20, 30, 50 person company. Yeah, totally agree with that. I love the, I love the uh, analogy to scouts. Um, maybe a related note. Um, we got a bunch of questions from folks about how to incorporate feedback as part of the product rollout process. And so I'd love to hear, uh, from you, Tara, how you think about you know, just creating those tight feedback loops around releases and any best practices there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the times we'll do uh, betas, right? So we'll select a couple of customers and this is where a cab also really is helpful because they can be kind of your, your go-to around things that they have been asking for and you have a tighter relationship with. Um, and being able to select them to be part of betas. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be them. We've also got a list of customers, for example, that have, you know, opted in to, to doing that. Um, and that way you can get quick feedback for, you know, a week or two to make sure that everything's, you know, meeting their expectation, expectations, running the way that you want it to before you kind of throttle up um, that release to the full population. Um, that's worked really well for us in the past. We ask you guys about, you know, when something breaks, um, and you need, you need to do a rollback or how, how do you know if you've lived through some of these, how do you know when something is broken badly enough that it's time to do a rollback and then any tips for rollbacks? Cause I, I think they're, they can be very difficult. Maybe a long, yeah. you're shaking. Uh, your yeah. Head. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, we did a lot of this. There's a, a lot of scars on my back, uh, at, at Slack. I mean, the, the first thing is, um, one of the things that Slack did right that I think a lot of companies before did, they're not unique in it, but but before they came around, a lot of companies didn't do well, is the customer empathy part. Um, and that comes directly from Stuart. I don't know if it's because he's Canadian or because he's a nice guy. You've, you've met him several times, Glenn. Um, he just really cares, like really, really cares. It's not a show. Um, and I think that that's important, you know, so when you have an outage, um, you, you show that, you show that to the world and you care about people and getting them back up and it, it pays dividends, I think. Um, you, you know, maybe you don't do it for that reason, but, but it does pay dividends. Um, as far as when and how and all that, we have a lot of, it's very metrics driven as far as accessing um, the, you know, the system and whether you are able to do you know, mission credit. Can you log in? Can you send a message? Can you create a channel? There's like certain things that if those things are broken, 
Slack is down effectively, and we need to all hands on deck to bring it back up. Um, other things, you know, like, you know, change your profile picture or something like that. That's not Slack is down. That is not like all hands on deck necessarily. Obviously it's an incident. People will be handling it, but very different prioritization. So there's certain actions that we just took as primary actions that um, constitute an outage basically. Um, I can't remember if there was another part to that question, but uh, yeah, scramble and get everyone on. To this day, uh, so the way Slack handles outages, I speak about Slack because I just don't know your table yet a month in. Um, there's an in there's a basically next incident channel. Um, the, there's an automatic uh, notification that goes into that channel. There's a uh, incident commander that gets assigned to it. And that person changes the name to a specific name for that incident, depending on what that incident is. And then another next incident channel gets created automatically. So everyone kind of knows where to go to, to see like the next incident. Um, to this day, Cal Henderson, the CTO and co-founder of Slack, will like leave meetings and jump on an incident. So like they're taken very, very seriously um, all the way, all the way up. And I think that that's important. That just shows, um, you know, the priority on, on customers that, that Slack has. Do you ever like war game uh, what it would be like to do a rollback um, so that you can plan, plan for it if you oh, yeah. do it? Yeah. yeah, there were several of those types of things. Um, uh, unfortunately, one of them created an incident, but um, <laughs> for the most part, they're safe. Uh, and we absolutely uh, try to see what would happen if an Amazon you know, firewall went down or something like that, something that's kind of like out of our control to see how would we, how would that affect us and how would we react to it? Kara, you guys have you guys have a different type of customer base, but you have a lot of customers also. So curious, curious if you've had you know if you've had this this challenge and any thoughts you'd, you'd share. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, we have a similar process where we have you know very tight incident management process that opens up in Slack channels similarly, and we have folks who are leading those. We have um, very tight processes around um, any kind of outage emergencies and what we do with customers with the level of you know, no communication that goes out. If we're totally down and you cannot get in touch with us at all for your IT support, that is basically critical, you know, level five. And we have different uh, response to that versus you know something happened last week where you similarly you couldn't. I don't know, access, you know, your device table in our platform for an hour, no big deal. You know, we, we publish that incident, but it's not something where we're going to send customer comms around it. Um, I think with respect to, you know, rolling out and, you know, when I was at larger companies and we, similar thing, if you could not log into our app, if you could not log into anything that was happening there, really understanding, um, getting on a call, understanding where you were at, what the prognosis was and having to make a call on whether, you know, you understood what the problem was and a fix was coming. And if you didn't and didn't have an ETA, you kind of have to make the call to roll back at that time until you do. Um, so I think it really just uh, needs very open communication, um, having the right people in the room and being able to understand quickly um, what information you know and what you don't and having to make a call. So we work with uh, a lot of founders and I think that uh, as I'm sure you guys have seen, founders always are thinking about moonshot product ideas. Um, and I'd love to understand a bit about how you think about prioritization within a product team, and particularly, you know, prioritizing being responsive to customer requests versus, you know, trying to take some of those moonshots. I know Tara, uh, you know, the electric product has evolved quite a bit in your time, so we'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, um, I think that um, I know like the Google approach, right? It's like the 20%. I think that's that's the ideal. And that's kind of like the textbook, but it's also Google. And I think in reality, um, you have to make some space, but it's really difficult because you have usually your product and engineering and design teams are mapped to business goals in year, right? And so you have a roadmap that you need to deliver on and you need to make sure you're tracking on that. So I think there's a couple of ways that we approach that. One is um, the UX research kind of looking ahead and being able to inform. And two is also hackathons. I think that's a nice way to get people to really get outside the box, come together, not even work with their regular teams and think of ideas that maybe we don't even think about day to day because we're very focused on what the customer needs are right now. And some of those have inspired things that you know we either have you know put into production or are coming back to, to potentially innovate on in the future. I think over time, it also starts to become um, more of, I mean, the way that I'm thinking about it is how can we um, think about it from an investment allocation perspective going in, you know, as we continue to grow and maybe have either a small kind of 
um, Skunk Works team, um, or a different way of thinking about if we have, you know, a hypothesis around a particular area that we think will be high value for us, how do we do that in kind of a, a lean way um, and validate as we go? Um, if, uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with him, um, Adam Nash, who was an early uh, PM at LinkedIn, um, it, it, he's put together a, a great presentation on this, basically. He calls them, I think, product buckets or something like that. If you just Google Adam Nash product buckets or something like that, you'll see his talk on it. Um, I, I don't think that I could do it better than him, so I'm not going to try. But one of the things that he doesn't answer uh, I haven't looked at the video, but I've seen him give this talk a couple of times. One of the things that he doesn't answer is the percentage of time that you should spend. You know, like Google has the 20, 80. Um, he's got his buckets, but when he's asked, you know, what percentage of time, he says, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have features, and he breaks it up into three buckets, uh, customer uh, requests, metrics movers, that are things that are going to be moving your KPIs, um, and then delight, features of delight. And he says, like, it doesn't matter if it's like, 10, 60, you know, whatever, 30, that's not important. What's important is that you are consciously thinking about the buckets quarter to quarter as you're planning and making sure that you have a little bit at least in each one of those buckets. And so you're moving each, all three of those forward on a regular basis. How you divide it up is probably like, you know, Tara says, it depends. Yeah, and I think that's exactly how I think about it. And I think usually PMs are like, everyone wants to know like exactly like how, like what is actually coming to, you know, my plate or what am I working on specifically? But I think being able to think at a higher level, what the buckets are and making sure to your point, like we got to do something in this bucket, how we get there and who does it, you know, can be figured out throughout the year. Organizational perspective, how do you think about who gets to make those decisions and, you know, who should be in the room and who, um, sort of can decide how much resources are we putting into one bucket versus the other. Uh, sorry, you said organizationally how we decide? I'm sorry, are you asking like who makes the decision or? Yeah, who makes the decision and how, um, you know, how different teams can prioritize or get to prioritize sort of within the roadmap. Um, that also depends on, on the size and growth and all that. You know, early on, it's going to be the CEO doing, you know, saying a lot of kind of like, all right, this is what we're going to do this month. This is what we're going to do this week. You know, you probably don't need a roadmap. What's the point? Um, you know, when you're five person in the garage, 10 people, 20 people and so forth. Once you have a product, like, you know, organization, basically, the product organization is, uh, in my opinion, DRI for that. Um, for, for basically what we're going to invest in and when that should come with input from engineering that should come from input from design that should come from input from research from data from talking to customers from sales and so forth but that's that's the point of a product organization is to put all those inputs together and say okay in that case this is this is what we're going to do um, but uh, but that that would come I think uh, only against when, once you have a, that product organization. There's a lot of inputs, uh, a lot of um, opportunities for input um, yeah. in your product organization. And that I think is very, very important as your product organization is not like siloed. Um, that's, that's totally critical. So we've had all kinds of different things from, um, you know, product gaps being filed officially in like either a spreadsheet or JIRA or Salesforce later on when we had Salesforce to um, monthly meetings where the heads of support um, customer success management and SEs would come together and basically prepare kind of their like top 10 or top 20 list of customer requests from that month. Um, and you have a readout of, of that um, too. Like I said, all the, the, the actually having product go out there and meet the customer where they are, whether it be, you know, Zendesk queue or, you know, on customer calls. So there's tons and tons of ways to get the customer input, but it's important that it gets funneled into one DRI and not all over the place. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's tons of inputs and all of that has to be looked at together and it's, it's very transparent. And I think there's also the other input of 
there might be a percentage of what needs to be invested in that's kind of future facing that's more you know these are this is the business strategy and so that's kind of where the, th the two things marry up around how do you make sure you're delivering what your customers want but you're also making traction against you know where you want to head into the future and that um i think that's the narrative around what the roadmap looks like and what gets prioritized and why is is really important in that sense um, we're, 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 uh, we're moving through the hour and I, there's one topic I really want to make sure we touch on. Um, we got a lot of questions about, and it's the hot topic of product led growth PLG. Um, and, uh, Elon, maybe, maybe start with you air, air table. You know, I think Slack definitely had quite a bit of PLG working for it, at least in the, in the early days, maybe less on the enterprise side, although, you know, it definitely it definitely was a big part of the business, but certainly at Airtable, um, you know, that that's a big part of things. How does, how does PLG change the calculus or, or, or reemphasize things for, for product teams? And if, if companies are trying to build PLG motion, what should they be thinking about in addition to everything we've already talked about um, on, on product? So, there's a there's a lot with with PLG. Um, a, a lot of times, first of all, uh, this is not anything that's new in enterprise. Enterprise has always had a chooser and a user, um, mm -hmm. and I think the difference over the last five years is that we've emphasized the uh, the user, you know, a little bit more so than maybe the chooser, and 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 that person has a little bit more power in the organization as far as the decision of what tools to use and so forth. And so for PLG, you focus a little bit more on that usability, basically. Um, what we did at Slack is we actually separated out. We created two different businesses. Um, and I led the enterprise and uh, Noah Weiss later on led um, you know, self-service and all that. Um, and his focus and his team's focus was just around basically PLG and product, you know, product like growth and, and usability and onboarding and activation and upgrade and all that type of stuff. Um, and, and my focus was how do we make the, you know, the top 10,000 customers, you know, extremely happy because they're going to want, you know, all the top down types of things like regulation and compliance and performance and scale and, you know, all those administration and all those, those types of features, basically. I think it was a really healthy thing to separate us, mm -hmm. you know, and basically say like, you focus on this, you focus on that. Um, because otherwise there is this tension of where do you put your resources? Where do you put your engineers? Where do you put your PMs? And we had that, but we had that at the annual cycle of planning rather than every single day. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like we were fighting every single day. It was just once a year we fought. <laughs> um, and, and each year, one of us would win. Um, so sometimes I got a dump of resources because enterprise was like a big focus. And sometimes he got a dump of resources. Um, and at the end, the teams, by the way, are about the same size today, six years in. Um, but they, they oscillated. Um, so at least that's that's how I how I think about it. Anything you're seeing, any you know, any any new learnings from uh, your first couple of weeks at Airtable? Um, at, at Airtable, uh, it's not quite as as structured as that. Um, which is not to say that that's a again that's a bad thing, um, but it's a it's a little there's a little bit of like PLG sprinkled throughout basically. So enterprise owns a little bit of PLG. Enterprise owns, you know, growth and enterprise growth and all that. Um, and platform owns a little bit of PLG. Um, so every PLG is kind of sprinkled throughout. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a little too early for me to tell you like it's great or it's bad. I have no idea. It's been just a couple of weeks, really. Um, but uh, it's a it's definitely a different model. Tara, um, you know, obviously electric is going after uh, the. Kind of SMB to mid market customer base. Um, does that impact at all? Kind of how you think about what's important, what to prioritize. Is it you know does does usability, um, onboarding, um, e you know, um, kind of the immediate customer delight with the product are those things that um, you know are more important in organizations where you're going after customers that are maybe smaller, less sophisticated. Uh, any, anything you'd, you'd share on that? 
Yeah, 100%. Actually, we just had a conversation about that this morning. I think um, you said, you know, small SMB to mid-market, there's actually like a big difference in our customer base when you get above, for example, the 100 person company and it's a different persona. And it's really important to understand who you're serving, both in terms of the chooser and the user. In our case, the chooser changes um, over a hundred people and their needs are different. And so being really specific around, you know, what they need and what that looks like, whether they're technical or non-technical changes our strategy and our roadmap. Um, similarly, the end user is someone we want to be able to focus on because if we're not giving them the IT support that they um, that they're looking for, and we're not delighting them, then it makes the the choosers or the point of contacts you know lives harder. And so what we want to make sure of is that they're also a persona that we're thinking about. Um, and so. I know we didn't talk about this, but personas are really important. Um, and knowing, you know, who you're serving and what their uh, what their needs are, what their behaviors are, what they're looking for is really critical. Um, I was really grateful that we were able to do this last year, and now the whole company is talking in that language, even at the executive team. And it, and you start to have much more strategic conversations around. Okay, well, if you know this is a, a technical Todd or this is a non technical Natalie and an end user Ellen. Um, my head of design is so happy <laughs> that we do that. Um, it's really critical because you know now we're having the conversations around. Okay, from a go-to-market perspective, if we're going to be doing this thing, you know, should we be focusing more on this, on this persona or that persona? Um, and that also changes. You know, you talked about onboarding what that might look like, right? So, you know, we always want to be making that more delightful, more seamless, uh, more easy, uh, but someone who, for example, is more technical may have a, a lot more sophisticated needs um, from, you know, a platform perspective than, for example, an HR manager. And I think it really starts with, you know, who you're serving and what their needs are, and that helps shape, you know, what you do. Fantastic. We're, we are at the top of the hour. Um, there's, we could go for another hour, I'm sure, but this has just been fantastic. Um, on, on behalf of Dan and, and, and everybody else at GGV and, and, and the folks at SVB, I just want to say thank you, Elon, Tara, for, for sharing wisdom, uh, a ton of it, and uh, for all of you for joining. Hopefully, we, we touched on most of the topics you were hoping to get to. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everybody again next week for the next. Uh, session involving enterprise, but Elon, Tara, thank you so much. And uh, I think they're, they're, the the outcome of this will be a lot of companies building great, great product teams going forward.